let us get started. This panel full of ex-Muslims is going to be moderated today by the wonderful Kelly Damaro. She is the executive director of the Secular Coalition for America, which is, oh yes, <laughs> the country's only secular lobby group on 14th Street Northwest in Washington, D.C. That's pretty much correct. Um, at the end of the month, I know that there's a, an event. I will not steal Kelly's thunder, because she should tell everybody what that'll be. And um, we have a lot of work in front of us, and Kelly and the Secular Coalition are on the forefront of making sure that Capitol Hill knows what we're doing, what are our issues, and that church-state separation is absolutely something that we need to be working on today. So. Let's get into it. I want to thank Kelly for being here. She is pinch hitting on this panel as moderator. Thank you, Kelly. Uh, take it away, my friend. Thank you for that uh, lovely introduction, Jamila. So what uh, Jamila alluded to is that Secular Coalition for America, we are your lobbyists. And at the end of April, on April 30th, we have our lobby day where we invite you to Washington, D.C. to be trained how to lobby by the fabulous Amanda Kanif, author of Citizen Lobbyist. We're going to give you all the materials and background you need, schedule all the meetings for you on the Hill, and put you in groups and send you on your way to actually talk to your legislators so they can no longer say, I don't have any atheists in my district. It's a wonderful event, and we're going to have two senators actually come and address uh, our constituency. It's really important to show them that uh, we don't only show up at the polls, we show up at their office and we're no longer going to be ignored. We're going to be the squeakier wheel. <laughs> but I know you're here for uh, something far more exciting and important, our discussion uh, with the ex-Muslims panel. And I'd like to introduce our fantastic panelists and give them a moment to, to give you a brief background uh, of how they arrived on this stage today. First, we have Hina Dadaboy. She is a blogger and an activist, and she's going to tell you a little bit about herself. All right, good morning, everyone. Y'all look more awake than I do, so kudos on that. Um, so I got my start sort of on the national stage uh, by joining Skeptic back in 2011. Uh, last year in August, I made my move to the Free Thought blogs so I could have my own platform, very punningly called Heinous Dealings, kind of like my name. Um, I left Islam about nine years ago. I've been out pretty much since I became an atheist. And um, that's a lot of the focus of what I do is sort of awareness through just being active and being visible. So that's a lot of what I do. Also joining us, we have Sarah Hader. She's one of the co-founders of the Ex-Muslims of North America. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Sarah, and I've been doing this for about three years. Um, myself and Mohammed were two of the co-founders of Ex-Muslims in North America, and I got started because I met him, the first ex-Muslim I ever met in my life. And it was such a wonderful feeling, and it gave me so much hope that I thought that maybe we could continue this and actually build support networks and communities all across the United States and Canada for ex-Muslims. And so that's what we do, and that's why we're here. And last but not least, our fellow co-founder of Ex-Muslims of North America, Mohammed Sayed. Good morning, and thanks for coming out. Um, so building off of what Sarah was saying, one of the things we often experience as ex-Muslims is a sense of isolation. A lot of people, after leaving Islam, stay in the closet. They don't talk about it with anybody. And we encounter that many, many times. So, what we were trying to do is try to connect all these people that don't want to be found, which is often seems like a Sisyphean task, where people that don't want to be found, you're trying to find them and connect them with other people that don't want to be found. Um, but, but despite that, we've gone public about 18 months ago, and in those 18 months, we've expanded to about 15 cities. There's definitely a need for the, the work you guys do, and it's, it's a 
very fast-growing segment of the, the secular movement. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, the positive reaction that you've received from members that have been joining your community? I want to give a little bit of background because, you know, I've been around, I've been kicking around for almost 10 years now in this secular movement. When I first came out as an ex-Muslim, the first thing I did was the first thing that a lot of nerds do. I googled ex-Muslims. All I found was ex-Muslims who now believe in Jesus and think Jesus is so much nicer than Allah. And I remember thinking, okay, they seem okay, but, you know, I'm not terribly interested in this whole thing. And then I found a few forums that were dead. I found a blog full of, well, not very nice people <laughs> who I tried to, to make friends with and it didn't really happen. Um, I met one ex-Muslim through a, a book website I was on. You could find other users who had similar books to you. And I found this guy that had all the atheist and all the Muslim books that I had. And I said, don't, please don't be offended if this isn't true, but are you also an apostate? <laughs> And he said, yes, but he was all the way in London. <laughs> and so, you know, I, I, when Ex-Muslims in North America happened, I said, why didn't this happen before and how do I sign up? And that sort of leads into what you all are going to talk about. But we do vet everybody because of the whole security and safety thing. And I remember when they asked, they said, okay, we need to set up a Skype interview and vet. And I remember thinking, I'm allowed and an out proud ex-Muslim, why do they need to vet me? Do you know who I am? But <laughs> <laughs> what it came down to is I'm actually very proud of having been vetted. I really am, because I feel like that's a good gold standard. And uh, yeah. So we tend to do that for everybody. Yes. Um, <laughs> the idea is that we don't make exceptions for anybody, including family. Um, the issue is that we have a lot of people that are in very dangerous situations. We have people that are on visas that have come here from, say, Saudi Arabia. Um, we have people whose families would kick them out. There may be violence involved. Um, not to say that's the only reaction. Uh, there are liberal Muslims, there are conservative Muslims, so there are people that get out of it without a scratch. There are people that have to go through a lot to get out. But we want to make sure that due to joining our community, no, that no harm comes to anybody. I mean, it's a huge educating experience for everyone. And back to what Kelly was saying, most people who join our group and they're like amazed at how many other ex-Muslims there are and the similarities we all have and, and the common experiences. And even though there is a lot of diversity, there are a lot of commonalities and similar problems that we went through. And normally our, our events are social and they're meant to be that way um, because a lot of these people, they're in the closet with their family and they're not allowed to do certain things. So we want it to be a social thing. We want everyone to feel like they can come and make friends and build um, a support network in a community that will be there and have their back. So how long has ex-Muslims of North America been around and, and how have you seen it grown both um, internally with your membership and gaining recognition from, from the outside world? So we launched publicly um, late 2013, so it's been about 18 months or so since we came out. <laughs> um, so, as I said, since then we've uh, been in 15 cities. We're expanding rapidly. We've been covered by mainstream media, um, the New York Times, uh, uh, national newspapers in Canada. One of the most amazing things happened yesterday. Um, there's a newspaper with wide circulation. Uh, it's a free newspaper you can get on the subway. And they did a piece uh, on us. And as a result of that, one of the mosques in Canada was talking about us yesterday. Um, and even more funny, one of our board members was in the congregation because he's in the closet. So he heard them talking about ex-Muslims while he was attending prayers as an apostate. Uh, and what the imam was saying during that was, we need to be better at solving our own problems. If the Muslim community does not reform, we will see more and more groups like ex-Muslims pop up and we will see people leave Islam. So even from the outside, we are starting to see change just because of our presence. And that's a pretty big deal. Yeah. <laughs> Moving from denial that you exist to concern over what happens when another option is presented, uh, that's a move in the right direction. Right, and that's, that's one of the most encouraging things, I think, that we've started hearing in the last year or so, where people, Muslim leaders, are talking about ex-Muslim phenomenon. What is it, and why are people doing this? And that's wonderful, because, like you said, you know, a couple of years ago, we didn't exist. There wasn't such a thing. Um, atheism, I think, was, is largely seen as a Western phenomena. So it's, it's nice to see it actually being visible to some extent. 
And even just on the personal level, I've seen it within my own family. People worry that if they're too strict with their kids, they'll turn out like Hina. <laughs> So there are at least, you know, two dozen children in this world who have much kinder parents thanks to me existing as their boogeyman, and I'm okay with that. <laughs> the importance of the cautious tale. <laughs> so is there a typical member of ex-Muslims? You do the, the thorough vetting process. Uh, do a lot of the same issues come up, or do you, do you see a variety of situations that bring people to uh, I would say there's world? a variety of situations, so a lot of people take a philosophy course and come out of it not believing in any divine power, period. Um, you can talk about that because you had something similar happen. Yeah, that was, my, that was my course out. I actually didn't know all too much about what was wrong specifically in the Quran. I just stopped believing in God first, and then everything else followed. Well, obviously, I'm not Muslim anymore. Um, I think his course was a little bit different, um, more Islam-specific, I guess. And that's that's like that with all our members. I mean, a variety of reasons why they leave, um, issues that are important to them. Some women leave specifically because of women's issues, and some men leave specifically because of women's issues, you know, and um, it's actually quite fascinating, and that's one of the things I love about doing the vetting process, is that we talk to these people before they come into the group, so I get to hear all these stories. I mean, I've heard hundreds at this point, and that's wonderful, because I know how varied the ex-Muslim experience is. Except for, I would say, every other person says, I thought I was the only one, and this is the first time I'm speaking to somebody that holds the same views as I do. So Hina was mentioning that uh, when you Googled ex-Muslim, you found Muslims for Jesus. Now that there's more of a, a community building up, when the, the people who are looking to find you Google, what kind of things can they, they discover? What can they stumble upon? find our website. <laughs> yeah. And they, found, they find other groups that are similar to us. Uh, Council of Ex-Muslims of Britain, shout out to them. They've been around for a while now. And they've expanded out to other countries in Europe as well. Um, you find my blog, <laughs> which is kind of funny. Um, you find you know, other ex-Muslim bloggers as well. And so you know, the, the, the poor uh, ex-Muslim Christians are buried on page two or three at this point, I think. <laughs> oh. Another victory. <laughs> oh, I, I don't know. <laughs> We're also working with uh, sister groups in London and Australia where they're setting up similar communities. So it's expanding out. Um, we're hoping in a few years, pretty much everywhere around the world, you'll mm -hmm. see the phenomena. There are already um, atheist groups in Pakistan and Saudi Arabia and Egypt, but obviously they can't come out publicly. Mm. Um, last year, a Turkish atheist group was established, and they are out and public. Obviously, there are consequences to that, but Turkey being the most liberal Muslim country, they have been able to do that. So what sort of impact are you seeing from uh, speakers going on mainstream media or, or getting a lot of attention when speaking out uh, against Islam on various sides of it and different views? How has that uh, impacted your work? We usually get I mean, a surge of new members. That's the first thing. They're like, wow, there's one, one person out there and they're talking about this group and so maybe there are more and they'll look us up and that's fantastic. I like to see us grow. I've also noticed, uh, I follow progressive and liberal Muslims on Facebook and Twitter and things like that. I like to keep up with what they've been up to. And it's hilarious to see an article about you being shared on these pages and these people talking like maybe you will never see it. Yeah. But you're actually looking at it and scrolling and going, all right, the usual, you know, she was ugly and that's why she left. You know, she, her faith wasn't strong enough. Islam is more progressive than Christianity and their humble opinions, so they think I'm wrong. But you know, the fact that they're just having conversations, and as much as I joke about the negative comments, there are Muslims who, th their issue becomes, what can we do? And that goes back to the whole idea of our mere existence being a catalyst for reform. So um, we did an AMA, Ask Me Anything, on Reddit a few weeks ago, and it got the front page of Reddit, so it got a lot of attention. As a result of that, there were um, conversations going on on the Islamic subreddit about how horrible we were, and people in that thread were commenting that due to our Q&A, they have started questioning, and they are looking into it. So just exposure to ex-Muslims goes a long way. It's because it's, I mean, I, I can't reiterate this enough. We're kind of assuming that everybody knows this. But growing up as a Muslim, you don't hear that people leave Islam. 
you know, the only you you you're you're taught to believe that that's not a thing that happens, except by paid Zionist shills, you know. Which we obviously which we are. are. Yeah. According to a lot of people. Yeah. The whole broke thing that I talk about, just an act. <laughs> well, we now all know if you're doing it right, then you're getting some pushback. What sort of uh, pushback have you all felt personally and as part of a larger movement? Um, what do you so get when you Google yourself? Yeah, <laughs> I try not to do that. <laughs> a wise decision. Um, so generally, you have people uh, like the ex-Muslim story of Jesus um, that want to try to co-opt us. We often get uh, messages from people that want our help to convert people to Christianity. Um, we get people that want us to uh, engage in anti-Muslim bigotry. Uh, there are lots of groups that are specifically targeted towards that, and they presume that simply because we're ex-Muslim, we no longer love our families, and we are willing to throw Muslims under the bus. My name is Muhammad. For all intents and purposes, to 99% of the world, I am a Muslim. So one thing we really stress on is uh, fighting back against anti-Muslim bigotry. To make the distinction between um, criticism of an idea, Islam, and criticism of a people. So. There are a lot of people both on the Islamic side that want to blur that line because they don't want Islam being criticized. It's a, part of, a core part of their identity. And on the other side, you have people that want to blur the line because they want to criticize Muslims. So obviously, the work you do is uh, dangerous, uh, difficult. But e internationally, there's, there's even more danger how have, uh, what have you seen? How have you worked with groups uh, around the world? And, and can you tell us a little bit about the, the broader global movement? Well, I guess I'll start with uh, probably the, uh, ha the hashtag that we made happen, yeah. that I saw born and, and sent out into the world, an apostate's experience, which came out of um, an, uh, Reza Aslan and his claim that being a Muslim is the worst because atheists are so mean. And it was sort of disingenuous, and he, he is kind of disingenuous a lot of the time because he, you know, he, he looks good on TV, he sounds really nice, you know, and all these things, but he really likes to push this idea that Islam is just super nice and you're misunderstanding us and it's just the Western media making us look bad and it, without an honest look at problems that do exist within the Muslim community worldwide and the various communities, I should say. So we came up with an apostate's experience to essentially say, hey, you know, here's actually things that have happened to us. So you can't deny that these are our lived real experiences that have happened to us. And uh, yeah, that got a lot of attention. I mean, it went well beyond combating Reza Aslan's disingenuousness. It became its own thing. And it's still ongoing. Oh yeah, no, I still tweet with the hashtag. If you look it up right now, probably someone tweeted about it within the past 24 hours. And so that was something I felt really proud to be a part of because it just connected us to people who weren't you know, in North America and we were able to sort of have this global venting session. And that on its own is just such a great thing to happen. I also think that was kind of an educating experience um, for, I mean, not just you know Western peoples who are not um, that familiar with Islam, but also there are people like, like Raza Aslan who are uh, educated and well off and they've grown up with a certain kind of Islam. That's not at all a common experience for everyone else. Um, most people don't get to, you know, marry out of, you know, their race or their culture or um, especially not the religion. Um, and he, he has been afforded uh, privileges that I think a lot of us don't have. And one of the things that I want to work on is to get these people um, to understand what, what the experience is for a lot of people. And because I think that that's part of the struggle, that they think that, well, I had, uh, I was fine because, you know, I went to, you know, I, I lived in the Northeast and my parents were liberal Muslims and so everything was fine. I was never coerced into anything. However, that's not at all a common experience. And part of that is to educate those Muslims as well and try and, and get them on our side to see that there is this common experience of um, a lot of uh, abuse, maybe persecution to some extent. Um, so that was, I think, a great part of it as well. I would say we're uniquely positioned to do that because usually um, I was at a conference where there was a conversation about the Pakistan being a failed state and everybody was talking about political issues and 
uh, Western uh, imperialism. Nobody brought up the problem with religion and the intertwining of mosque and state. And the, when I brought that issue up, I, we had a lively conversation. When other people that were there that weren't from the same background joined in the conversation, they were immediately labeled bigots. So that's uh, something that we need to change in the sense that fact-based conversations should be allowed by anybody. Anybody that has the right information should be sharing that information and moving the conversation forward. Con I don't think we should be shutting conversations down simply based on who is doing the talking. One of the more, uh, one of the issues that should be talked about more, I think, but um, we might need a little bit of a, a primer on is what's happening with the Bengali bloggers. Could you explain that, that situation a little bit and what's happening there? Well, I think Asif's going to cover that right after us. But okay. overall, you know, it's part of this global upsurge to some extent of just really intense violence um, from Islamist factions, from sort of people who are getting angry about fairly, you know, to our eyes, trivial things. And it doesn't just affect ex-Muslims, this violence. It affects anybody who speaks up. It affects anybody who likes the wrong page on Facebook, you know. So an example of that, um, in the UK, there's a reformist Muslim, Majid Nawaz, and uh, Ayan Hirsi Ali mentioned him yesterday as well. So he's a Muslim. He runs a counter-extremism think tank. And last year, uh, at the London School of Economics, at the Students' Fair, somebody was wearing a T-shirt that had a cartoon, Jesus and Mo. Look up the cartoon. It's amazing. Um, <laughs> So they, the students that were wearing that T-shirt were kicked out of, of campus as a result of just wearing a T-shirt. He tweeted the cartoon saying that a cartoon does not offend me. And as a result of that, he got death threats uh, in London, internationally. A newspaper in Pakistan printed that um, it is obligatory on Muslims to kill him. And all he had done was tweet a cartoon and say that, as a Muslim, this does not offend me. So what's on the horizon for you all and, and your efforts? There's lots of work to be done, and, and you're growing rapidly, but uh, what do you see as the next steps? Well, one of the things that I'm incredibly interested in, you know, with you mentioned Madid Nawaz, is really connecting with and supporting the efforts of the true reformers. Not the ones like Reza Aslan who say, oh, Islam's fine, don't worry about it. It's just the Western media brainwashing you. Um, but people who are actually taking an honest look at Islam and at the global issues with various Muslim communities and saying, these are problems, we need to deal with them. Um, and one of the groups I recently connected with actually is called Masjid, M-A-S-G-D, the Muslim Alliance for Sexual and Gender Diversity which is a group of LGBT and queer um, Muslim progressive activists. And I met them at Creating Change, which is the National LGBT Conference. And we actually had a lot in common as far as, you know, the stuff that we deal with with our families and the things that we want to see changed. And so that's one of the things that I'm really interested in doing is building alliances with people who are able to and willing to say, yes, there are problems in the Quran. We need to actually deal with them and address them and condemn them as needed. Yeah, and I think uh, those people get tend to be overlooked by by everyone, by by Muslims altogether, and also I think by by us, by Westerners, those people get overlooked. And it is encouraging to see that they are growing. They they are there. They are growing. They are speaking out. They are gaining supporters slowly, but it's there. And I think part of something that we can do, um, the secular movement overall, is to give these people a platform. And also just acknowledge that they exist, because I know people think they're very clever and funny when they make the joke, oh, LGBT Muslim, isn't that an oxymoron? They don't exist. But, you know, and it's, it's, it's funny in a way, but at the same time, it's also erasure. You know, these people do exist. They have always existed. And, you know, you know despite the um, efforts of homophobic religion of all kind, there have always been LGBT people in all communities. And I think it's important to remember that they do exist. Any final thoughts or stories you want to share before we open the floor up for questions? Um, I would want to add on to that, that if you look at every single Muslim country around, um, be it Pakistan, be it Egypt, Saudi Arabia, you guys have heard of Raif Badawi. Um, every country has activists that are, are secularists, be they Muslim, be they ex-Muslim, that are trying to change the uh, rapidly growing Islamist phenomena. And when we often talk, talk about that there's nobody standing up, why, why don't we hear these voices? It's because these voices are being marginalized in their own countries. Pervez Hudboy in Pakistan, has, uh, he's a physicist that uh, talk, 
talks and his passion is educating people and uh, improving the state, state of science education. And he has had uh, attempts to kill him. Raif Badawi is in jail. Other activist, Avijit Roy, um, was murdered two months ago. So all, in every single country, you'll find people that are speaking up, but we need to help them and amplify their voices and make it easier uh, for them to speak up and harder for those that are trying to oppress them and silence them. And the internet is great for this because it allows us to, because in, in Pakistan especially, a lot of books are, you, you can't publish them, you can't, you know, even if a bookseller um, puts out a certain book, they can be threatened um, for just having it there. But I think the internet makes this a very difficult thing to do. And I think we need to use that to, what, to whatever extent we can to push this literature and these, you know, ideas into countries where it would be so difficult. To piggyback off of both those points, the number one question I think a lot of the times when you say you're an ex-Muslim that you get in gatherings like this is, well, what can I do? That's the number one thing. And signal boost. Signal boosting is so important. So if you have even the smallest platform, if you can get ex-Muslim and secular Muslim and reformist Muslim voices out there to people who wouldn't otherwise know we exist, just sharing a quick link even without endorsement, if you're afraid of that, you can just say, hey, I thought this was interesting. Why don't you check it out? And that alone is just so helpful to us because I can't count how many times I've done a talk and had a student leader or a local community leader come up to me and say, we have an ex-Muslim in our group. We had no idea that there was a group. And so just letting people know that we exist is just such a great help to us because, you know, I talk a lot and very loudly, but I can only go so far with that. <laughs> Thank you all very much. So we have a few minutes to take some questions. Uh, I believe there should be uh, a microphone moving around. And while that's getting set up, um, I will say please uh, make sure that your questions are questions. So they end with a question mark or a voice inflection going up at the end. Uh, and we do have a lot of people that do want to ask, so um, try to, to keep them as, as brief as possible so that we can cover as many topics as we can. The first hand I saw was right back there. A few rows back. Back, back, back. There he is. <laughs> Hi, uh, two questions. One is, would you care to estimate how many people have uh, given up uh, uh, Islam uh, and are now in the West or, or elsewhere? And the other is, do you, ha do you sense that there is a uh, a movement to transcend nationalism so that we can consider you guys maybe a new nation? So I would say um, internationally all of us are working very closely together. There are very few ex-Muslims around so we're very tightly knit. Um, then a good amount of them are, are in the closet. So, and I would, I would even say the great majority of them, and they're not going to reach out to us, and they don't have no plans to reach out to us because of the safety issues. So it's hard to estimate exactly how many are there. There was a uh, uh, poll done in Saudi Arabia which estimated that around 5% of the population is atheist. Um, that's right before they had the law that atheism is terrorism. All right, next question. So red shirt over here, and then the next one will be that gentleman right over there. Thank you. Um, Mohammed, you talked about um, anti-Muslim uh, bigotry and drawing the line between um, criticizing a person as opposed to the religion. I would like some advice about this. I've run into big trouble. I'll be talking about it tomorrow morning. In trying to do that, I don't want to be horrible to people, the human beings, but by, many Muslims have said to me by criticizing, calling their religion a memeplex that infects their brains, um, they are deeply offended, it's their identity. Can you give me any help in steering this course between the person and the religion which is so important to them? I would say that offense does not bigotry make. That's number one. So just because somebody feels offended by the fact that you said something. You know, people have told me my very existence is Islamophobic, just me being alive and saying what I am. Um, I would say that if, it, if you could replace the word Muslim with, say, Middle Easterner, and it would still read okay, it might be a little bit racist or bigoted. 
But if you, if you could replace it with Christians or Jews, then that's a little bit more of a criticism of a religion rather than a group of people. Um, one thing you'll encounter regardless, as you alluded to, identity. Um, for 1,400 years, it's been the idea that as a Muslim, that is your primary affiliation, your primary identity. So anything that challenges Islam is taken very personally. I don't see a way around that until that uh, core identity is replaced. Um, when Turkey secularized, uh, one of the things other Turk uh, did was try to replace uh, the Islamic identity with a Turkish nationalistic identity. And to a great extent, that is what propelled the secularism we have in Turkey. Right. I mean, he wrote down uh, Islam as sort of an Arab uh, phenomenon, which was his way of doing it, and it, I guess it worked. Um, but that is a broader problem. That the, that and, and I think that there is a lot of there are a lot of Muslim leaders who are who are mixing up the two on purpose: criticism of Islam and criticism of Muslims. Which is why I don't like that term Islamophobia because it counts for both, which is which is absolutely it makes it makes it so that we can't talk about anything, and we can't criticize anything. That's why we like anti-Muslim bigotry right. a lot. We like anti-Muslim <laughs> bigotry. Mm -hmm. There was a gentleman right there on the uh, other aisle. Hi, guys. I love the work that you're doing. Please keep doing it. Keep up the good work. Um, I noticed from your description of the process of vetting and helping to provide group support for especially people who are still in the closet and can't get out. That seems very similar to the clergy project and Dan Barker's work. Have you contacted them? Are you working with them in terms of strategies and goals and helping your organization to survive and do and prosper as well as they have? So um, we have talked with them. We've compared notes regarding our vetting process and regarding security measures and made sure that any ideas that we hadn't had were, we took them and implemented them as well. <laughs> and I know for a fact that there are um, Islamic leaders like sheikhs and scholars and imams, at least a couple, in the clergy project, right there. which surprised me, honestly, but. Yeah. Wow. To add to that, we just had a member that joined a girl whose husband is a very conservative imam, and she's an ex-Muslim. Her husband does not know. One of my local, well, like, I, I know one ex-Muslim that I know was the kid that everybody unfavorably compared their kids to growing up. You know, he had, he had come up with this big accomplishment at age, I think, three or four or five. He was just really young to have done this accomplishment, and everyone's like, you can pray, he did this whole thing. And I met him and I said, you jerk. <laughs> you know, you're the guy our parents told us we weren't as good as. <laughs> and now he, he's eating bacon and drinking cocktails with me. So, hey. <laughs> All right, we have one right here in the green shirt and then the gentleman uh, on the end over there. The lady right here. Are you able to give us some details about your vetting process, or would that be uh, unwise? Oh, no, we don't share that. OK, thank you. <laughs> Gentleman right behind you. Good morning. Thank Good morning. you for sharing with us. I want to ask you if at some point in the future we can expect that the Quran will become a book, like Mein Kampf is a book. I would say it would become a book like the Bible is a book. Right. Um, <laughs> there are lots of very obvious scientific errors and historical errors are in the Quran. The thing is that a lot of academic research hasn't been done the way it, uh, the Bible has been analyzed for centuries. It's starting to be done. Um, I just uh, read a book uh, about a single verse where somebody did their PhD analyzing the historical context regarding that single verse. Um, so there are other schools and other people that are doing actual academic research work on the, on the history, on the <coughs> linguistics of the Quran. So uh, over time, as that research accumulates, it'll be harder and harder to maintain the line that everything in it is perfect. 
It's also a de facto thing where a lot of Muslims, you know, all mention, they'll ask me why I left Islam and I'll name a verse and they're like, why do you care so much about that? And they clearly don't actually care that much about it either. And that's a, that's a good sign. <laughs> We've got time for two more. That gentleman in the back has been very patient. Have there been any consequences as far as you coming out, threats to you physically or your family? Well, we've had threats um, online uh, quite a bit, um, but we expected those to some extent. Um, most people, I think, are too lazy to even email us, but those, there are some that do. Um, there was uh, one gentleman who uh, was emailing me back and forth a little bit. I mean, he actually didn't email me directly. He emailed Mohammed and me in the same subject, uh, in the same two box, but he only addressed Mohammed and asked Mohammed if he could debate me. And, uh, um, and so this, this gentleman showed up at uh, a talk that I was giving. Um, and that was very interesting. That was the first time that I was giving a talk and this guy shows up and starts railing against me and everything that I said was wrong and I asked him, are you a Muslim? He's like, yes, and then he goes on and on and on. So that was my first talk experience. That was pretty interesting. <laughs> it takes dedication to fly out to a conference. It does. I, I, I mean, I'm almost admiring him. Like, <laughs> That's dedication. Our final question from the front row right here. The, the Quran has to be uh, read in Arabic. Uh, and you cannot translate it, for what I understand, it's not. Um, and so when you try to um, speak with a Muslim uh, and you've read the Quran in English or in French or in any other language, they always find an excuse and say, well, you haven't read in Arabic, so you don't know what you're talking about. Um, and so w what is the way to go around that? They always um, set a way higher standard for us than they do for, our se for themselves. Because most Muslims do not speak Arabic. They can read it, they can read words, they can parrot them, but they don't understand what they're saying. So bring that up with them. You can always say, hey, what about all the Muslims who aren't Arabic literate? Are they not true Muslims because they've never read the Quran in Arabic? And they say it can't be translated because Arabic is just so deep and complicated. That's a cop out, frankly. Because, you know, how many Muslims base their faith on translated Quran? Most Muslims. I did, I mean, I'm semi-Arabic literate, kind of. But, you know, most of my understanding of Islam comes via English language sources. Well, because God revealed his word in Arabic. And allegedly, you know, one word in Arabic can have 5,000 kazillion meanings and they're all contradictory and they go on and on about this stuff. But again, they're setting a really high standard for the critics, a standard that they would never apply to themselves. Also, Arabs are the minority Muslims. Like 70, 75% of Muslims are not Arab. And even among Arabs, uh, Egyptian Arabic is the most common. So Saudi Arabic is a minority even among Arabs. And even among that, you're talking about an uh, Arabic dialect that was 1,400 years old. It's not the popular vernacular. So even people in Saudi Arabia will have trouble with the exact dialect that's in the Quran. So as Hannah was saying, no Muslim really understands the Quran than either. <laughs> it's like trying to read Shakespeare, you know? You need help. And so, <laughs> and, and so the Arabic of the Quran is like the Shakespeare in English in a lot of ways. If you'd like to learn more about the ex-Muslims of North America, please uh, go down to the exhibit hall and visit their table uh, and, and ask some more questions. I'm sure they'll, they'll be uh, interested in, in talking to you a little bit more. And I'll be down there as well at the Secular Coalition for America table. Thank you all very much, and thanks our panelists. Um, also, after uh, Asif's, uh, Asif's talk, we wanted to take a group picture. Um, we have a few handouts of activists that are imprisoned or have been killed recently in the Muslim world. And we wanted, um, on the back right after Asif's talk, to take a group picture, and if you guys could tweet about them. Thank you.